I, I would like to ask that everybody just mutes their microphones during the presentation. Um, and I also ask that if you have questions, if you could put those in the chat box for us uh, so that those are ready for when we, um, when we do the discussion. So please, any questions in the chat box uh, would be very helpful. So I'd like to welcome our first speaker this afternoon. Colleen, Colleen Campbell leads the external engagement in the uh, open access transition at the Max Planck Digital Library. Uh, she coordinates the Open Access 2020 initiative, a global alliance of research organizations and their libraries that is driving the transition of today's scholarly journals to open access uh, publishing models. Colleen, uh, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carly. It's, it's a delight to be here. Um, thank you all for your hospitality. I'll go ahead and open up my screen, my screen sharing. And so I think you've got now my slides in the proper mode. Um, right. So, um, yes, indeed. Thank you all. Um, I, I, would, I would like to give just a very brief presentation um, with a few notions about the open access transition in scholarly publishing that is happening right now. And but I'm really looking forward to the discussion later. So um, to answer the question, I think the question that we are has been posed in the seminar is, should the University of the Free State uh, renew their subscriptions um, to scholarly journals? And my answer to that question would be, no, not exactly. <laughs> not exactly. Why? Um, because currently, um, we, we must come to the realization that we are in a situation where business as usual um, is no longer appropriate. Um, there is a transition underway in scholarly journal publishing, and I will show you um, a little bit more about that later in, in my talk. But because of the transition happening and because of the new benchmarks that have been achieved in the open access transition, a simple subscription renewal simply cannot be justified any longer for an institution. Um, coupled with that is the, 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 the understanding that author facing fees for open access publishing in hybrid journals um, really cannot be justified anymore. We have examples in the field of open access um, publishing fees paid by authors have been reined in by institutions. Uh, and so um, if that can happen in, in, in different parts of the world through different kinds of agreements, how can we continue to justify that? The, the baseline for what I'm presenting today and the concept of transformative agreements is really that scholarly publishing, scholarly communication, scholarly publishing is part of the research process. And you know, we, we think about authors who receive funding from their institutions, their departments, or from um, grant funders to produce research. And um, they use that, those funds for many different activities, and one of the key activities is engaging with their peers, right? Um, even sometimes authors can use their funding to participate in a conference, an academic conference. Well, that is a form of scholarly communication, just like scholarly publishing. And, and so it is really the institutions and the grant funders who should support authors in, 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 in open publishing and not um, author, you know, author fees, authors fees, it's the institutions and the funders who should help support the production of research through open scholarly communication. And um, the, the, with that understanding, the, we really have to think about how institutional investments, current investments in scholarly journal publishing need to transition away from subscription paywalls and become institutional investments in open research communication, in open publishing. 
Um, that is basically the premise of the Open Access 2020 initiative, which is, as mentioned before, a global initiative um, of research institutions and their libraries, um, really that has um, come to the realization that in order to arrive at a fully open paradigm in scholarly communication, it is not enough to invest in um, infrastructure to sustain open publishing or invest in open access, new open access journals. Uh, we need to integrate our open strategies with a strategy for the, the established current subscription journals, which represent um, you know, 80 percent of scholarly publishing today. That um, the, the way we can transition our subscription investments to open access, one of the key ways has been um, identifying this transformative agreement, this mode of negotiating with uh, the, the established uh, um, publishers of scholarly journals. And in the final statement of the 14th Berlin Open Access Conference, which united uh, research administrators, libraries, researcher organizations from around the world. Um, they, they gave their support to this statement. And this statement was issued to some of the largest commercial publishers, um, players in the world today. And they were, we, we communicated to them that we are committed to the transition. The journals are published um, by, by the large commercial publishers are some of the journals most valued by different research communities. And if the researcher communities value those journals, then we will be willing to work with the scholarly publishers on modes to transition their journals to open access and transformative agreements as a temporary and a transitional strategy um, were identified as um, fully viable and also um, that they should be cost neutral, meaning there is the understanding that the money currently invested in scholarly journals, in subscriptions, is sufficient to transition the journals to open access. And so we are working on that baseline. This is the baseline of publisher negotiations. Um, so transformative agreements uh, driving the transition. If we think about a moment about how we interact currently, how we as libraries interact currently in, um, in, in, with publishers, we have our annual subscription renewals. And then on the other side, we have authors who might be paying open access APCs to publish um, their articles openly. But these are two parallel um, streams of funding of, of excuse me of revenues for scholarly publishers and I would like to talk you through now a bit about transformative agreements and how they actually enact this transition okay so there are different drivers that transformative agreements between institutions and publishers um, work different drivers that you know carry us through and I will describe a few of those to you now so the first driver is open access publishing. This is what we want, right, as, as, as institutions and researchers. So today we are in a situation where authors are, for the majority of journals, required to give up copyright of their research articles to publishers. And we want to move to a fully open paradigm in scholarly communication communication where authors can retain copyright and openly license their articles so that they can are free to re share, use, reuse their work and science can move forward faster and the science can be um, improved because um, by making it open uh, and open to the scrutiny of all peers, gaining the broadest possible readership, that will help um, improve the quality of science. So, so how do we get from where we are today to where we want to be? Um, we need some sort of a bridge, a framework that can, or a catwalk 
to work us through this transition phase to get to that paradigm. So transformative agreements are those agreements that essentially um, institutions govern that opportunity through an agreement, securing in their negotiations with the publisher the means, the means being their former subscription fees to be used to cover open access publishing fees, um, to publish ideally 100% of the articles by their researchers openly in hybrid journals. Another driver is for the institution, really, um, organizing their investments around open access instead of paywalls. You know, as, as, as I've mentioned before, right now, institutions pay annual fees for their subscription access, reading access, and in parallel, authors are paying um, APCs on top. And we want to get to a world where the investments institutions and funders are making are oriented around open research communication. Uh, I'm mean, thinking really about how are the budgets formed in our institutions? Um, they are the budget lines for the library. There will be a line item dedicated to subscription renewals, but um, this, is a, a, this is an annual budget line, but it's not necessarily the case that as research, as, you know, as time goes by, as um, you know, the publishing profile of any given institution changes, that that funding will correspond to the actual needs of the researchers and their open research communication needs. So we need to work through that transition, reorganize how the budget and how the funding flows through our institutions to support open publication. And so having all of the funding streams under the oversight of one institutional agreement enables us to begin to think about how we organize our budgets. Another driver is price transparency. The, the current situation is such that the subscription fees paid by any given institution or national library consortium throughout the world is utterly opaque. Our agreements are behind non-disclosure clauses and in for the most part institutions or at least the libraries who are the ones who maintain the, the relationships with scholarly publishers on behalf of their institutions, they, they have no understanding of the APCs that their authors might be paying. So it's a completely opaque um, scenario we have today. And because of that scenario, we are it, it's, it's difficult to have um, scrutiny of the fees being paid and the costs involved and with scrutiny be able to um, put market pressure on the fees and perhaps compare fees of one publisher over another. And we want to move into a world in which the services provided by publishers, their open publishing services, have fees that are transparent so that we as a community can compare the costs and determine what is a fair price, what are we willing to pay for the different services provided, which might enable us to do cost comparisons with perhaps non-traditional, um, non-commercial um, publishing entities. And this competition then will foster more innovation among um, in, in scholarly publishing services. So transformative agreements are, are an institution's first opportunity to really begin to assess the service levels being provided by publishers for open publishing services and demand that the services, that the fees for services be articulated in a very transparent way, um, in, a, in a way that can be compared with other services. So it's by engaging in the agreements that we can foster the conditions for an open paradigm. And yes, optimizing processes for open access. Currently, the workflows that institutions 
and publishers have in place around scholarly publishing are very much rooted in the print era. Um, just think of think of all of uh, the, the library process processes around um, invoicing and and what kind of yeah how do we assess an agreement right we collect counter usage data and we analyze that to assess the value that any um, agreement with a publisher will give us we want to move into an open paradigm where um, authors are supported in open publication in a way that is seamless and reduces friction for them to publish openly. Right now, authors have to jump through many hoops and um, yeah, it, it's very cumbersome. And we want to free up authors to enable them to focus on their science and not so much the administrative tasks of, of publishing openly. So transformative agreements are an opportunity for um, libraries and institutions and also publishers to rethink all of their processes and workflows around how can we make it easier and re, uh, remove the friction? How do I how do we identify my, an author from a given institution so that we are able to track um, the author's article through the process of, of publication and um, uh, in, ensure that the author is informed of their open publishing opportunity negotiated but by the institution um, and facilitate their selecting an open Creative Commons license, for example, and ensuring that, yes, this author's articles is paid for by, by, the, by, uh, by her institution um, and not some other institution and only paid for once, right, for, by the corresponding author's institution, not a co-author's. We want to avoid that as well. So we need to we use transformative agreements to um, give us the opportunity to reorganize our workflows, build up the, the capacities that we need to support open access publishing on a large scale. And so to summarize, all of this is really making a commitment an institutional commitment and a commitment on behalf of publishers to an open paradigm in scholarly publishing. Currently, the subscription system that we have is perpetuating barriers, um, and both for readers and for authors who are required to pay APCs um, on their own um, if they want to publish openly. We are working toward an open uh, paradigm with open access as the default not as something other, as an add-on, but the default in research communication. So negotiating, engaging in um, transformative agreement negotiations is really the moment where publishers and institutions put their money where their mouth is, really say, OK, we are not investing in paywalls. We want to invest in an open paradigm. Um, so those drivers, I've just presented a few. You can read more about it on the ESAC's, um, on the ESAC website, which is ESAC is a sister initiative of OA 2020. And it's more about the actual practicalities of putting the, the, um, the, the idea of OA 2020 transition, using our subscription funds to transition to scholarly journals to open access. ESAC is about putting that into practice. Um, so by adopting all of these um, transformation drivers in um, publisher negotiations, libraries and national library consortia around the world have been able to really um, start a, a wave, uh, an enormous amount of momentum in open access publishing. Here you can see that in the past few years, we have reached over half a million scholarly articles that have been enabled open access um, uh, through, the, so, which means that in South Africa, there at your institution, you are able to access over half a million articles thanks to the transformative agreements negotiated around the world in Asia, Latin America, uh, North America, Europe. Um, also in Eiffel, I Eiffel is an entity that negotiates on behalf of um, institutions and library consortia in low and middle income countries. So this is this is an uh, um, an initiative that involves um, all stakeholders, not only 
the, the rich global north uh, countries, but because you know, the, the expectation is that agreements can be cost neutral, um, everyone can participate in this transition. And here I'm just sharing with you one recent benchmark, um, keeping in mind that we are in a transition phase and the drivers that I, I presented to you before um, are different characteristics to transformative agreements, but it's impossible to think that we go immediately from the subscription paradigm to the fully open paradigm. We are working through the transition and we might make progress on one aspect faster than on another aspect. And each agreement is different because it's really rooted in the subscription system. That is our starting point. But every library or every consortium will have their own starting point. Um, we are, each agreement should build on the previous agreement and we should learn and build on the benchmarks of our peers. So this new benchmark that you might have heard about is an, a very recent agreement negotiated by JISC, the National Library Consortium in the UK, with Elsevier, the largest scholarly journal publisher in the world. And um, through very strong alignment of their stakeholders, and this is key, strong alignment among stakeholders, meaning the university association, the rector's association, um, the researcher organizations, the libraries united in this um, political will for an open access transition in scholarly journal publishing, they were able to um, uh, indicate to the publisher their expectations for an open access transformative agreement. And through that strong alignment, they were able to obtain their goals, which um, means that it means for the rest of us in the world, it means that 80% of the scholarly articles produced in the UK um, uh, 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 is now well, through all of JISC's agreements. 80% of UK research can be made um, openly. And that means we have access to this huge amount of content throughout the world. So it's not only a benefit for the research community in the UK, authors enabled to publish open access without fees, author facing fees, but supported by their institutions and their funders. But the rest of the world is able to benefit from the agreements by being able to access this brand new research coming out of the UK and, and, and in many other countries of the world, as you saw before. So I leave, I will close now, um, just you know, reflecting on what this could mean in Africa. Uh, this is a, a, a view of the scholarly publishing output of South Africa, um, journals indexed in web of science. So of course it's not all journals, but a, a good chunk of South African research production. And where are the articles published? In the journals of Elsevier is the largest, then Springer Nature, um, Taylor and Francis, Wiley, etc. And imagine the impact for authors in South Africa, for their articles to be published openly so that their peers around the world can access their content. And not only around the world, but in the countries sitting right next door to you. Uh, what, 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 what impact would that have for those countries that perhaps cannot afford a, a subscription to all of the journals of Elsevier, all of the journals of Springer Nature? Um, this is a transition that has impact in so many ways. And with that, I will I will stop and look forward to the discussion a little bit later. Oh, thank you very oh, thank much. You very much. Uh, there's uh, been lots of questions in the in the chat box, and we've been having a discussion while you're talking okay. about the impact of this for our university. Um, and I think that was the idea with this morning is that we get a global perspective uh, from Colleen, which is uh, very useful, and that that we then talk. Uh, about our local contexts, and then also at the end provide Charlie uh, Molepo with an opportunity to comment from the university side. So um, before we go into questions, I'd like to ask Ellen Tice and Glenn Turan to, to uh, present 
for us on the national uh, context. Ellen uh, Tice is the Senior Director of the Library and Information Services at Stellenbosch University and is through her appointment uh, directly involved in the open access publishing debates. Uh, Glenn Taylor has been the director of, I'm sorry, Glenn Turon has been the director of SUNLIC, the South African National Library and Information Consortium since 2014. Um, and Glenn has been actively involved in SUNLIC's open access transformational agreement task team. So uh, Ellen, over to you, thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, Coralie, um, good good afternoon, um, colleagues. Um, yes, I just want to start off by uh, thanking the University of Free State uh, for inviting Sandlik to participate um, in this uh, seminar today. Um, uh, there's been a lot of developments, especially over the last two years uh, from the South African side. And as we've also heard uh, from the previous presenter uh, globally um, over the last um, 10 years or so, uh, there had be indeed been an acceleration um, on the open access uh, movement and initiative around the world. So, um, so this is uh, very timely, uh, and we look forward uh, to share with you this afternoon of, uh, what uh, has been happening in South Africa and specifically from uh, the South African National Library and Information Consortium uh, around uh, these initiatives and where we are uh, currently uh, uh, in implementing uh, some, some of these initiatives. So firstly, over to Glenn. I will speak to you again later uh, and then we'll end off the presentation. Glenn. Thank, thank you, Ellen. Um, I tr just not if you can hear me. Yes. <laughs> oh, great. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, I've got. Um, I'm, I'm going to make sure I'm watching the correct screen. Um, I was looking at the comments in the in the comment section um, while Colleen was presenting, and I would like to answer the question about uh, should the the free state continue to subscribe to academic journals that are behind a paywall at the end of our presentation. And I trust that what we're about to present will will go some way towards addressing some of the questions that were raised. I think essentially that we we need to be aware that <clears throat> for South Africa, um, some of the key issues are firstly to maintain or improve our reading access to scholarly information. Um, so th there's a concern that not everybody can afford all of the subscriptions. And uh, so that's an issue. Secondly, um, our, our uh, national um, policy on open science is promoting the idea of open access and the idea that all articles should be as open as possible and only as closed as necessary. Um, yet, how do our researchers afford to pay for this open access? So that's the second challenge. Um, and then thirdly is the containment of costs or how to reduce costs. So with those three concerns in mind, let's let's delve into some of the detail. Firstly, um, annual subscriptions to to, uh, uh, to to journals seem to go up in price all the time. And, and often publishers use the argument that um, there are so many more articles and or journals included in the package that that one is subscribing to and therefore the price needs to keep keep climbing and and while there's an element of truth in that the, that you know that simply is 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 not sustainable um this this particular graph shows the the output for the for the entire world for for research articles and and conference proceedings and you can see the the uh, citations catching up um, as time passes. Um, so if one looks at the overall world picture, um, uh, it appears as if rough, nearly 40% of, of articles are available in open access. And that means that the other remaining 60% are still out of reach for those 
uh, who cannot afford to to pay the costs associated with a paywall. Um, when we zoom into South Africa, we, things are slightly better, but it is still uh, by no means a satisfactory situation where where it's more like 40, 46 to 47 percent open access. And um, if we, we drill into that into a little bit more detail, this, this particular website um, has a very interesting breakdown of, of that material. So the, 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 that which is in gold uh, is open access freely available from a publisher's website. Some of those would be in gold journals and others would be in hybrid journals. Um, the blue represents uh, the same material, but also that portion which can be found on other uh, platforms such as um, university repositories, blogs, um, preprint servers and, and, and the like. And the stats that you're seeing there are, are the stats for, for the research output in 2021. So 44% in spite of this green open access portion, 44% of our material remains behind closed doors. Um, I also just for interest included a, a, the view for, for the University of the Free State, which is available from the same website. Um, just just for your reference, and, and you'll see that that a, a larger portion is is behind a paywall. Uh, one of our biggest problems is is cost control, and and it doesn't help that we have one of the most volatile currencies in the world. And this purchasing power parity comparison between the, the South African rand and the US dollar and the Great British pound. It shows that um, over the last 10 years, we've lost over half of our um, our purchasing power. So even uh, if there were no price increases, uh, we would still be facing a serious problem. And uh, so the situation is just, just not tenable. Um, so if if the University of the Free State does decide that it wants to um, cancel certain subscriptions, the unsub uh, tool is a very useful tool that costs only a thousand dollars a year, which would enable you to work out how you could cancel a big deal subscription and rather subscribe to a smaller uh, a la carte package of journals in such a way that um, uh, you would still be able to guarantee most of the reading access to the entire package by combining uh, a limited a la carte subscription with interlibrary loans in terms of your costs um, and then uh, rely on your, your uh, post-termination access and on back files, uh, open access, uh, that we've already discussed, as well as the portion of your subscription and interlibrary loans to reach at least 78% of the fulfillment of the of the access, and yet to to pay for that with a far smaller portion of your library budget. Um, so, uh, Sadler conducted some research um, on the South African research output in Web of Science from 2014 to 2019. And um, what we did is we, we asked the question, what would happen if all the journals were to convert to full open access overnight? Would, would it cost us more or would it cost us less than the current situation where we're paying library subscriptions as well as a limited portion of open access publishing. And to do this, uh, we, we used the data I mentioned, and we, we gathered the, the costs of the subscriptions, the reading costs, together with the publishing costs. And, and the actual figures we used was the 2019 research output, but we applied the 2020 publishing cost prices to that. And all currency was converted into US dollars. Now, um, 
using Delta Think's um, uh, research on, on on world output, it's 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 just important to note that um, you know what sort of article types are out there. So this dark gray represents articles in journals that are closed. In other words, journals that won't accept any form of open access. Um, and you can see that those those have been diminishing. The next two areas, the, the lighter gray and the blue, represents hybrid journals. And it's interesting to note that in hybrid, hybrid journals, although there's the option to pay an article, uh, an author-facing charge of some description, um, to have your article published immediately open access, most authors opt for whatever reasons, but probably cost is one of them, to publish behind the paywall. And the growth of open access in hybrid articles, as you can see, is, is negligible. Uh, in fact, the growth of the closed articles in hybrid journals is, is far more. And, and it's encouraging to see that gold open access articles um, are growing quite significantly. So against that backdrop, we, we wanted to analyze what was happening with South Africa's research. Another interesting observation from Delta Think is that they got information from all the publishers and, and asked, well, how many of your articles are being published by you open access? And it was 30%. So the other 70% they were publishing closed. Yet their revenue from library subscriptions was more like 93%. And only 7% of their revenue was coming from the this 30% of articles. And it clearly follows that in a fully open access paradigm, the cost the overall costs to institutions would be significantly lower. So there's just supporting Colleen's point that there's more than enough money in the system. But how does that apply to South Africa? And, and what exactly is a transformative agreement? Um, again, Colleen touched on this, but I'd like to highlight one or two of the, the key things. I think one of them is uh, that both reading and publishing services are combined in a single contract. Um, authors retain their copyright and they are able to publish immediate open access in the subscription journal of their choice without any author facing charges. And perhaps there we should specifically refer to hybrid journals. Um, so what did our research reveal? Um, this is the research is based on only the corresponding authorship articles with open access status. So what this is showing is that uh, the the blue and and the light blue, which is is open access but but at the whim of publishers, uh, is still growing amongst um, uh, our article content. Uh, yet the gold open access is the is the area where there is the biggest growth and uh, hybrid open access publishing is not growing. So if we look at that as a percentage of the total number of articles each year, um, you, you get the, the picture more clearly that um, the share of closed has been declining, although in real numbers it's still growing but that the, the real growth is in gold open access. So library subscriptions continue to grow, and yet if you isolate the um, open access publishing costs, uh, you'll see that they are growing at a rate of, uh, they're doubling every three to five years, uh, which means that a, a new cost center is 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 adding to our woes at a time when we can least afford it. Now, if you look um, at where uh, our, our authors are publishing, um, there are at least there, there are more than fifty Sandlick deals uh, with publishers, and the first. Um, Six columns refer to Sandlick-related uh, 
deals. So what this is showing you is that in the top five publishing deals, um, most of the Sandlick research output is, is in those top five deals. And in fact, most of the subscription expenditure is in those same deals. Yet when you look at the share of open access, it's proportionately very low when compared to publishing in journals that are outside of Sandlick uh, deals. And when you look at the, 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 the publishing outside of Sandlick deals, most of that is, is gold open access. And uh, there are probably very good reasons for all of that, one of them being the affordability for authors to, to, to cover the author-facing charges. So what this also shows is that if we were to want to ensure that our research is as open as possible, the obvious places to address this matter would be in the large deals, transformative agreements with the large publishers, um, because that's where most of the traction can be gained, especially if one can ensure some form of cost neutrality. So. This is also a, a reference to what it would cost if we were to flip. And notionally, if we were to take all the Sandlick agreements, where, we, where the blue represents the subscription fees and the other colors represent the uh, publishing fees, if, if those, all those journals were to flip overnight and we were only to pay for publishing, um, what we would see is that um, the overall cost to publish only, in fact, should be uh, roughly half of what it would cost um, to both uh, read and publish at the same time. So if we were to transition successfully, that would be fantastic. If we were only able to achieve that, achieve that with the top five publishers that are important to South Africa, um, uh, we would probably achieve 40, uh, a saving of about 44%. Um, I must just stress that this is a notional uh, concept and that the devil obviously is always in the detail. Um, so what we're observing here um, is that um, if we don't change anything, our open science objectives will not be achieved and most of our research will remain behind the paywall um, in spite of the fact that our open access is growing. Um, and that our costs are going to continue to be uh, growing exponentially. But I think the big challenge is are our institutions ready for a transition from a subscription paradigm to an open scholarly publishing paradigm? And, and with that, I'm going to hand over to Ellen, who's going to speak about what we have been doing. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, uh, following then the data analysis, um, Sandlick um, then uh, published a, a position paper on open access in which we have now considered um, the data uh, that we have collected uh, and also considering all the other developments that have taken place up till that time. We then said, okay, from a South African point of view, how what do we do with this now? What do we do with this data? Uh, and how do we now move forward um, in joining um, uh, the uh, the movement and to see how we can transition um, uh, South Africa's uh, researchers and research output then also to this uh, new open access uh, paradigm. In this statement, um, we then, and that was in 2020, that we ha were very clear that we would like to look, and if I look at some of the questions that have been put, at an approach um, that will be fit for purpose for South Africa, keeping in mind, of course, um, uh, our historical 
facts and then also the fact that we still need to look to see what what will work in South Africa and what are the factors that we have to take into consideration. Uh, and we then said in 2020, we're not quite uh, ready to then consider transformational uh, agreements, uh, but uh, uh, and that, that these are some of the areas that we want to, to consider. Uh, when we were then um, more confident that uh, we are uh, in, at a point where we can start to consider transformational or transformative agreements, um, we presented the SANDIC board to the SANDIC members in uh, June 2021, a proposal uh, whereby we said that uh, based, based on, on, on the data analysis, we've developed some principles that we are now ready to proceed then uh, with transformational agreements. So um, the members then adopted in June 2021 uh, the following principles that uh, we want to share with you. Um, and uh, so you can carry on, thank you. Um, so the principles were really developed with the intention of, number one, replacing existing journal reading subscription agreements, which no longer served the interest of our researchers and the South African national system of innovation. Secondly, with agreements that incorporate now reading and publishing services. And in so doing, we expect to grow our members' research agenda and the dissemination thereof by negotiating agreements that incorporates the principles that uh, we uh, listed below. And then also we then adopted then these uh, principles. So I'd like to highlight the four because this is particularly very different and especially the first one um, in terms of uh, many other countries who have also developed such uh, principles for negotiating uh, transformational agreements with publishers. And uh, uppermost and number one and top for us in South Africa, considering, as I've indicated, our history, the um, uh, differences, um, the inequities in the higher education system in South Africa as a result of our history, the whole issue around and a principle around inclusivity and social justice that must be core when we consider transformation, uh, transformative agreements in South Africa. And that means that publishers must have an equity, diversity and inclusion plan that addresses the challenges of researchers in the global South. Secondly, that we were uh, uh, looking for in a single agreement for reading and publishing services. Thirdly, read access will not be compromised as we've already heard earlier on for our researchers, and again, based on the questions asked already, and the question that's being asked at the University of Free State, which we will answer, and we have already had some feedback also from, from Colleen, um, uh, it actually, it is something absolutely crucial that at this point in time, that we can't compromise read access, including perpetual access and post-termination access, and fourthly, Researchers can publish full and immediate OA in the venue of, of their choice to ensure the widest possible reading audi uh, audience. So this was really in terms of the first four, but particularly number one and number three were two of the principles that we felt that uh, very strongly about that we should consider. And I will say a little bit more about that when I look at the activities going forward uh, and particularly around the social justice aspect and how do we see that we should address that uh, going forward with uh, uh, new negotiations. The rest of the principles, um, um, as I said, 16 principles in total, these are very similar to what many other institutions and those ha who have successfully negotiated um, 
agreements. I am not going to go through each of them. Many of these, to some extent, have also been part of what we've had um, previously in terms of our print subscriptions, in terms of interlibrary loans, uh, etc. Of course, uh, uh, it has to be published under the Creative Commons uh, uh, attribution license, and and all of those renewal prices, pricing, very much a very part of what we had in the past as well. Uh, but we wanted to make sure that these principles also apply um, as far as uh, read and publish uh, agreements would be um, would uh, con uh, are concerned. So the next slide, um, uh, Glenn. Thank you very much. So, so we then uh, identified, um, as I said, uh, uh, these uh, principles. Shared that with the publishers, and uh, now how do in order to implement now that, and based on the decision that we want to now to proceed with transformational agreements, um, Sandlick then um, developed a negotiating priority plan. As we've indicated on the slide, the plan prioritizes agreements that are up for renewal. Of course, we have every year there are a number of um, uh, publishers' agreements in terms of what we've had up till now that comes up. And we then obviously started uh, based on the year in which we have to renew uh, these uh, agreements. So we started, then we said, OK, so we will start with those that are coming up for renewal. And then we would look um, at those with, which have the potential transformational traction that can be gained based on our principles and, of course, our goals. So we have considered then, when we looked at that, the overall expenditure for that particular uh, uh, product, the number of subscribers we have, the research output associated with the agreement, the potential for saving, evidence of previously negotiated transformative agreements, and there we've looked at the ESSEC register and also participated in a national and international um, uh, initiatives in order to see where and learn from those that have already negotiated this. So uh, based on that, and those, that's all the, the data that we had to collect, that we collected in order to prepare then for the negotiations. Um, the results of this was, in terms of um, the uh, plan um, that Sandlick has up to date, uh, to date uh, uh, negotiated six agreements that include uh, the ones that you're seeing on the screen, uh, the Association for Computing Machinery, Cambridge University Press, uh, Emerald, uh, SAGE, the Royal Society, and then um, Wiley. And uh, in all of these, the initial uh, term that we have uh, recommended was a three-year initial term. But you will note uh, with the next slide uh, that gives a little bit more uh, detail of these agreements that in some cases um, it was actually it's it's longer than the three years that that we have uh, anticipated. This slide gives you then a little bit more detail of each of these six agreements that we have signed to date. As you will note, those are the six that I've mentioned. So it gives um, you an, ind an indication of how many subscribers um, are participating in this particular uh, transformative ag agreements. In some cases, um, there are actually more Sandlick members than who would be subscribing to this uh, particular agreement, but members had the option um, to um, elect uh, to form part of this agreement. And of course, it differs from institution to institution. But certainly in the one, in the case of Wiley's, you can see um, it's a substantial, um, basically 28 of our members, uh, which are of course more than the institution, uh, just the universities. So th it gives, that's the first row. Secondly, it gives you an indication of the agreement period itself. And as I said, in the case of Wiley, for example, uh, we the agreement um, in fact is from 2022 to 2025. Um, it also gives uh, uh, an indication in terms of the read access. Um, as you can see in all of these first six that we've signed, uh, read access uh, has been entrenched um, in the agreement to ensure that we continue to have read access. And in the case of Wiley, 
Um, read access uh, was also upgraded for some of the institutions who have had, because we've all had different um, uh, read agreements uh, with Wali and had not included uh, the full package. Um, then again, in terms of in most of these cases, hybrid journals, um, and uh, it gives you an indication there um, how many hybrid journals are uh, in this particular deal. Um, it also indicates uh, whether there is a limit or a cap on the um, uh, journals or the articles that uh, we, the members, uh, South African researchers are allowed to um, to publish um, under this agreement in for that particular publisher. In the case of uh, Wiley, um, the first year, this year, it will only apply to the hybrid journals, but from uh, 2023, um, in the next two years, it will also include uh, the gold open access journals of Wiley as well as in Dawi and uh, Glenn, um, uh, maybe you could just come in here as and call in. As far as I know, this is the only deal uh, that uh, that Wiley has signed to date, which include, for example, the gold open access and Hindawi. Uh, Glenn, can you confirm that? that? That's correct to date. Yeah. Okay. I suspect so, Egypt might also have that sort of a deal, but it hasn't been announced yet. Yes. Okay, and then um, we, we can see also in terms of the gold open access in the case of SAGE, it will include a 20% discount. Um, um, and then Cambridge University uncapped, uh, ACM and so on. So you will receive, of course, the uh, presentation. So more details, you can then look in more detail into the uh, specific um, information that you see in the screen. Uh, next slide, uh, Glenn. Um, so, so I've, I've focused now, basically, we, the, the plan, we have three phases uh, and that we have been rolling it out now in these three phases. Uh, the first three of the six that we've already signed, that was already concluded actually before um, uh, phase one, the official phase one. So phase one, which was in 2021, started in 2021, that has already, of course, been completed. There you also have a very clear indication of those um, publishers who we have identified for phase one, that we were successful with the three in terms of signing those three agreements. The others, we were unfortunately not as successful. Um, some of those will now be rolling over to phase two in 2022. And the others, um, then they were basically um, one. Um, I just want to make sure the IEEE one, uh, who we have not been able to um, reach an agreement for a transformative or transformational agreement, and we therefore had decided it would be best because it would not have been beneficial for us to sign, not just in terms of the cost, um, but there were also other factors that we had to take into consideration. And therefore, in the case of IEEE, we have uh, signed a three-year uh, agreement and that would continue as a read-only uh, agreement. So the three that um, we have then um, rolled over and we only signed because, as I said, we couldn't reach agreement, read-only um, agreements uh, uh, was Springer, um, IOP Science Extra, uh, as well as um, Oxford Journals Online. Those are the three that we were not successful in 2021 and are now rolling over to phase two uh, for where we now negotiate for 2023 and beyond. So in addition to the three, the two new ones that we will be adding um, for 2022 that we will negotiate based on the fact that these are now agreements where uh, uh, are coming up for renewal, uh, will be Science Direct, um, and the other one will be the American Chemical Society uh, that we've added um, in 2022. So we are in the process of now, um, we will be uh, uh, communicating with these publishers and uh, we hope soon, as soon as possible, to start with the negotiations with uh, these uh, six uh, uh, publishers, five publishers. Uh, in 2022, and phase three, well, uh, we will be looking at uh, the 
two that you see there, Taylor and Francis and the Royal Society of Chemistry for 2024 and beyond. Uh, next slide, thanks. Um, so I'm coming towards the end, uh, Charlie. <laughs> um, in terms of, um, as so, so that's our um, success to date um, in terms of uh, where we are. But of course, it doesn't mean, and again, based on many of the questions that have already been posed, um, how do we still? There's still a lot of things that we will have to work out. We can say this is a kind of a trial, but in terms of our response then to our plan. How do we move forward? First thing that Sandlick had now done is to establish an open access, uh, open publishing and access task team, SOPAT, um, to advise the Sandlick board. The objectives of this uh, terms of reference have been approved to develop action plans for negotiations, uh, develop plans to improve dissemination of SS scholarship, identify pilot and implement alternative forms of for the for the above negotiate training for essay researchers and negotiate publication mentorship with uh, leading publishers. Um, the other uh, last four um, objectives, identify methods forums to increase exposure to essay researchers, um, develop and roll out advocacy plans for the deconstruction of systemic inequalities in the system, monitor and evaluate transformational agreements entered into by Sandlick, and then, of course, uh, as we've again heard earlier on, we will uh, would advise the board proposed amendments, changes, if a transformational agreement no longer meets Sandlick's needs or our objectives or where the cost becomes unaffordable. And we back to square one where we've been up till now. So those these are the um, specific um, objectives of this, uh, this team in response to the work that we've been doing to date. And then the last slide is really just in terms of SOPAT then, the activities today, we've already started. Um, we started off by analyzing the lessons that we've learned from the uh, negotiations that we've had uh, last year for the three agreements that we've signed and how what can we learn from that going forward in terms of the negotiations for a plan for this year. Um, that uh, we will evaluate um, and the evaluation Glenn has already started uh, to actually uh, look at the um, agreements, what the impact of that had been um, and uh, we looking at the criteria, how is this in fact some of the questions that ask how do we know that this is actually achieving what we want to do. That is exactly a part of the activities that we will be doing, that we will be reviewing the Sandlick Transformational um, Agreement negotiation principles. The work has already started on that as well. Um, that we will also uh, working, Sandlick is uh, developing or working uh, uh, to develop an initiative um, of uh, where we look at um, uh, the global South countries to see how can we collaborate because of these, of course, also differences between us and the global North. So how can we also and what can we learn from each other, from the other global South countries that we will develop training for members and researchers. And for example, we have already uh, start with the Wiley training, which is of course one of the major deals that we've already signed. Uh, planning meetings with stakeholders. Um, this will be uh, library directors. Um, and then as well also with researchers. Um, um, and then of course also with other stakeholders such as the NSLOP um, and, and other uh, major stakeholders. Uh, to see, um, uh, to give an update like we're doing today, but then also to identify which are the areas that we still need to work on. And um, uh, USAF, the uh, USAF board had also requested via the CEO, Professor Ahmed Bauer, uh, that a writing team before uh, be formed to specifically advise the USAF board, the, basically the vice chancellors, on um, how to proceed and what the impact on open access and open science and all of these things will be in terms for the university. So uh, Sandvik has also a representative um, on this uh, writing team. Glenn? 
Right. Th th thank you very much, just, Ellen. Just, just, uh, just, just before you do, Charlie, um, uh, uh, don't uh, shoot us yet. We are really finishing off. But I, but I just want to think to say that it's very important in terms of the review of the uh, principles. Some of the things that we're specifically looking at, uh, and that is the removal of bias. Questions were asked about, um, you know, in terms of quality, uh, in terms of. Um, uh, 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 quality of the journals itself, uh, uh, predatory journals, there's lots of those things. And um, we want to make sure in terms of in, when we go into negotiations now for the next round that we're really looking at, um, you know, how and publishers will have to tell to tell us that we how can we remove uh, a bias uh, from scholarly publication, the developmental programs that they need to contribute to research, um, increase research in South Africa, um, research output, that we, the development of mentorship program, as one of our members of SOPED said, we also look at ourselves, what must we do? We can't just say to the publishers that what, what they must do. For example, we would like to see that there are some memorandum of understanding signed with seasoned authors to mentor young authors, for example, in South Africa. Um, and that a proportion of aggregate subscrip subscription from South African institutions must be set aside for the development of the next generation of authors, that we want to mentorship for reviewers, these um, that they should be compensated um, for acting reviewers in ways such as APC exemption if they publish in a journal that they have reviewed, um, that um, we want to increase and demonstrate, uh, publishers needs to demonstrate a commitment to use global South reviewers more frequently, um, et cetera, and of course, support for local publishing. And there we also have some very clear goals. So, so we are trying to address a lot of the questions that you've asked um, by uh, uh, be very clear, what do we want out of this? Okay. Right. Thank you, Ellen. Um, so, so back to the question um, around whether or not to subs continue to subscribe to journals. I, I find it very helpful to to think in pictures and imagery and 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 uh, allegories. And um, I I recently saw a clip from the the film Gladiator. I don't know if any of you have seen it, but um, our hero is. Um, He's uh, in the dungeons underneath the Colosseum, waiting to go up to, to be part of a, a fight. And the soldier in charge says, well, guys, it's a lovely day to die. All the best. I'm sure you're going to die in glory, um, expecting them not to survive. And um, what, what happens is that um, they re re are reenacting a, a battle with a formidable foe who's who's far better equipped with with better technology, chariots and what have you, and and I guess I'm I'm trying to make an association of the University of Free State versus the publishers here, and um, what happens is that our hero, who used to be a um, a, a general in the in the Roman army, convinces some of the fighters to. To work together and stick together to 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 fight the common foe, and and on that basis, against all odds, they they manage uh, to win the battle. And so um, I would suggest that if we are going to cancel um, subscriptions, that we should we should do it in unity and together um, at the appropriate time, but that we uh, at the same time could could. Uh, really give transformative agreements uh, a go, provided that we, we, we pay careful attention on how we uh, restructure around a, an open access paradigm instead of a subscription paradigm. And, and with that, uh, that's the end of our presentation. Thank you for listening to us. Thank you very much to Glenn and, and Ellen. That was very informative. Glenn, I'm sure um, we will share uh, all the slides. Um, I'd certainly like to have a look at some of that, um, some of the data 
in a little bit more detail as well. Um, before we go into questions, I just want to introduce Mr. Charlie Mulepu. Charlie will be joining the discussion, um, and I haven't introduced him because he's making the closing remarks. So Charlie is a professional librarian. Uh, he's He's the Deputy Director of the University of the Free State Library, and he's responsible for research and scholarly communications. Charlie also currently serves as the LIASA President-elect until the end of 2023. So, Charlie, welcome to you. All right, then we go into questions. The first question is by Cornell Skeltema van Wijk. Cornell asks, are publishers manipulating the idea of transformative agreements to be less than ideal for authors or institutions? I'm asking if transformative agreements are achieving what it's set out to do. Colleen, maybe you can take a first stab? Yeah, sure. Um, I think my response to this would be, first of all, transformative agreements were a strategy proposed by the research community, by universities and libraries. So it was their demand for open access that that created this, this wave. And I think one of the key lessons learned among those negotiating uh, has been to define the objectives, um, define what it is you want, and even go so far as to make the offer to the publisher. Right, we are the consumers, but we are also the producers of the research that pass through their journals. And I think it's important that we um, take up the leverage that we actually have and use that to request what we think is um, the, the the what are the services that we would like and the the fees that we think are fair. And, and and that is the starting point. Um, whether publishers try to, you know, you manipulate this is, is another story. But the key here is to come up with our own idea of what we expect and make our offer to the publisher. Okay, thanks, Colleen. I don't know if any of the other panel's members would like to add anything. Uh, Glenn, maybe you want to add something? Um, I, just, just the one slide that um, uh, Ellen shared, where, where we look at the ex the actual results on the transformative agreements that we have so far, um, I, I would suggest that in terms of the access, the ability to publish, um, and the containment of costs, I, I would I would say that so far we we are on track, um, and and um, I'm very pleased about that. Uh, but but you know the, the I think the battle is not yet over. But I I think that we should never underestimate our power as a consumer. And and a perfect example in case w that the University of Free State was involved in was the negotiation around clinical key, where we stood together long enough for them to realise that if they wanted any customers in South Africa, they had to come up with an agreement that that was uh, addressing our needs. Um, so, so I am encouraged that we, you know, we can do that, provided we keep our eye on making sure that the transition doesn't last forever. And we say to the publishers, at some point, you know, if you haven't yet um, converted your journal to to full open access, well, we're not going to play anymore, and we're not going to pay for subscriptions. And that that takes some courage. It does. Uh, thanks, Glenn. So we have a question by Jeremiah Peterson at Stellenbosch University. I think one of my concerns with Open Access 2020 is that by flipping the subscription budgets, we're assuming equal subscription budgets across institutions. Transformative agreements are still only uh, accessible to those with money. So to some extent, it still marginalizes research communities that do doesn't have financial cap capacity for subscriptions. Um, I don't know who wants to comment on that one. May I just say one word of introduction here? I want to just make it clear that this is a question that is, of course, um, on the minds of library consortia around the world. Uh, when I said before that right now, our interaction with scholarly publishing is rooted in the print era, um, and we need to work through this transition to uh, to arrive to a point where our budgets are reoriented 
around the future, which is open. And that is a, a process of transition. Library consortia have a, a lot of value to offer here because they, around the world, they are creating new cost allocation models to smooth that transition. Um, there are conversations happening with the national research funders to aid in that transition process. But uh, and so this is a transition that 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 has to happen in order to embrace open science and open access fully, just to, to offer that notion. Yes. Thanks. Uh, Ellen? Yeah, I, I just want to add uh, one thing to uh, to what has been said. So, so Jeremiah is not so much in terms of uh, those in the transformative agreement itself that those that have been able to participate in it. Um, uh, what what is what the problem would be, and why you know we need to continue to do what we what we're doing is is that it's probably that those that currently can't access. Um, um, uh, uh, publications to read that they would still if we if we flip the model to APCs instead of read then of course we're talking about a large community from the south and developing countries that would still not be able to afford the APCs because they didn't have the money in the first instance uh, to um, to to read and now they would still not be able to um uh, to 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 pay to publish and and that is where it is important in terms of some of these principles and that we need to ensure that we do not um uh, create um the inequity in the system that already exists so so yes and it's more than so Colin I talked quite a bit about um you know what is achieved um you know in 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 parts of the world how many more people can have now access and can read um, but uh, what we just need to know, you know, it's it's a lot more for us here in South Africa and in Africa than just being able to read what other people publish. We want to be part. We want also our things to be published um, and be able to read because a lot of what is then published in the other parts of the world doesn't. It may not necessarily be relevant to what we actually need in order to for our developmental agenda. Thanks, thanks, Ellen. Uh, Glenn, you also would like to comment. Uh, thank you. I, I just want to add that that one should also look at the the actual numbers involved, both the numbers of articles being read and being published, as well as the financial cost behind those. So, so whilst um, Jeremiah's concern is on everybody's mind, I, you know, I should point out that that the cost of reading is so much higher than. The, the amount, the cost of the publishing in the in the volumes that we're talking about for the global south. So, so um, at the moment, if 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 a South African university is not subscribing to a particular journal, they cannot read South African articles. Um, whereas with these transformative agreements, um, those articles are now becoming accessible not only to the South Africans but to everyone in the world. And at the same time, our authors are able to publish there without any author-facing charges. So, um, so, so if you're from a, an institution that cannot afford to read, you still have the challenge of the article processing fees, but they are significantly lower uh, than than what we're talking about with the current uh, paradigm. Thanks, Glenn. Then we have a question by Carleen Paul Albertijn, who is a Sochi chair at um, UFS. I'm concerned with the perception that paying to publish lowers the quality of publication. Ellen did talk, talk about this, but I think it's important that we that we read her question. There are at least two open access publishers who growing who are growing drastically, taking over the scientific publication landscape. Various review forums I have been on, uh, the, uh, on the various um, review forums that I've been, uh, there were concerns raised about the review practices of these publishers. Um, maybe I can provide uh, Charlie an opportunity to maybe comment on that. Charlie? Um, uh, thank you, Prof. To, to be honest, it's always the case that we, we would hear these concerns. But the reality is that um, the, 
the perception that when you, when you look at the, once you make it more open, then it becomes the, the it, it becomes easier for one to see the quality because now the, 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 the whole review is open. So you can immediately see where there is a challenge. That's why here at UFS, we, we, we are investing uh, in, 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 in some software that would, would assist our researchers to quickly identify area, uh, areas where they should not publish. Uh, we have recently subscribed to Fidelio, where uh, we'll use that uh, uh, software um, uh, 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 system to, to identify and advise our researchers and our authors. So in, in essence, yes. And, and, and obviously, it's also happening within those clues. The biases will always be there. But the, the, the reality is that as an institution and as a consortia, we, we build those uh, 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 safeties. Thanks, Jolly. I'm running through the questions. So um, if you'll allow me the next question, this is by Maslala Mulepu, who asks, any guarantees that open access idea itself is not driven by market forces? For instance, you mentioned a move from workflows that are based on print towards workflows that are based on infrastructure uh, and standards development. The question is, are the companies who develop the infrastructure and standards not getting paid? So this is an interesting uh, financial question. Um, uh, Colleen, do you want to take a stab? And then I'm going to ask Glenn and, and, and um, Ellen to comment. Yeah, I mean, I think actually what... Um when I think about workflows, what I'm really thinking about in the end is data. Um, and, and how do we um, capture data around the institution, the funding, uh, the funder that provides the grant, the 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 author and its and the author's affiliation, and capturing that information at the earliest possible point in the 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 publishing process uh, is something that will benefit. The, 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 all of us, you know, we will understand what we are paying for. We will understand um, the impact of our agreements, and um, and so transformative agreements are an opportunity uh, for for libraries and institutions to begin to think about the, this, and also certainly the providers. In fact, you see um, organizations like Copyright um, Clearance Center who have have. have have been used by library consortia to help manage um, uh, the, the the different payment streams. Um, you have submission systems that are now looking to adapt their processes, and this is a good thing. I mean, we want all of the infrastructure in the world to be able to support open access on a large scale, Crossref and and um, ROARS, etc. So, um, yeah, th this is an opportunity for us. It's a, an opportunity for everyone. Thanks, Colleen. Uh, Glenn, if I can get to the next question uh, for you, we're running out of time. Glenn, how do we deal with publishers who want a deposit of 20,000 euros in order for our users to get a 25% for APC? Glenn? I, th I think I'll give you a short answer that, that um, one has to look at the deal caref carefully, specifically, and and look at the detail around it before before making a decision. It's very hard for me to comment on that um, out of context. Um, yeah, so that 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 would be my short answer there. Uh, Corey, if I could ask, send, uh, refer them to Sendlik, and we will negotiate <laughs> and tell them we are not paying anything. <laughs> Thanks, Ellen. There's one question from Lisa van der Westeisen, which is the last question we're going to take, um, but I think it's an interesting one. Will the National Open Science Policy of the Department of Science and Innovation enhance and support SUNLIC and institutional initiatives? Glenn and Ellen? Ellen, do you want to go first? Maybe just to say that, yes, we actually did have a slide um, on that, and I said we should delete it. Uh, indeed, um, 
we have also been involved in participating um, and um, SOPET uh, from Sandlick side, and I know also Chelsea in terms of the library directors, uh, we are all working on a response and providing input specifically for the sector within um, the open science policy. So we're very much involved in that and we'll be providing uh, comments and feedback uh, into the policy. Thanks. Something from your side, Len? Yes, um, I, I, I find it interesting that one of the parts of the open science policy is to suggest that incentive systems need to be aligned with, with, with the objectives that, that we're looking to achieve. So I'm, I'm hoping that uh, there would be more support there uh, for synergy. Um, uh, I just want to go back to one of the questions about the quality of open access venues. Uh, um, because it, it, it relates to this question. Um, in the current system, you can only purchase your, your reading access and your publishing access from, from one, supply, one supplier, and therefore there's absolutely no competition. Uh, you know, one should look at Porter's Five Forces to have a, have a look at this. Um, with the transformative agreements, we're enabling our publishers to publish at their venue of choice, in the journal that they trust because of their career development, without any author-facing charges. But what is also happening is that as things develop, that journal will have to continue to compete with new journals coming online and, and other venues who can provide the same quality of publishing but provide the same level of access to to peer review, um, and 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 to to citations and to to the the wider public to read and access. So what is going to happen is now that every journal in the same field is going to have to compete not only on quality but on price. Um, and so with time, I I believe that there there are many reasons why a lot of costs can be avoided and that like with data, um, I mean, I'm, my current contract was 10 megabytes. I'm now on up to 50 megabytes and I'm still paying the same price. You know, um, the competition is fierce and, and uh, that, that can only be good for the consumer. Thank you very much. Uh, colleagues, we've run out of time. We don't have any more time for questions. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Charlie Mulepu to make the closing remarks also give a perspective from the University of the Free State side and then close the meeting, Charlie. Thank you very much. Uh, Charlie, you muted. Thank you, Prof. Um, after um, a library review uh, 2014, uh, the university decided to create this uh, unit, uh, which is research and scholarly communication, under the leadership of Betsy Esther, who has since uh, joined CUT. And and in our first year in the establishment of this, we we then moved towards open access. And what 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 we were able to see prior to 2014, this institution, this university was neither ranked by any of the universities uh, ranking institution that you um, use um, research output as 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 a as a as a as a criteria but after 2015 we, we saw a, 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 a quite a number of them and and even within the country moving uh, three four places uh, uh, going forward and uh, it's not so what we what we have managed to do as as the university um one of the things that we've seen immediately one of the observation by the reviewers of the of the library review was that while our authors are, are sweating and working quite a lot they are they are their research is not visible and 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 because of that when we created this uh, institutional repository of the scholar, um, one example that uh, we were sharing with colleagues, uh, there was one dissertation uh, 
by uh, one of our law uh, colleagues here. In one year, it accumulated over 5,000 downloads. And in the same year that we made it open, it was able to receive two citations. Um, as, as a university, what we have done also, we have taken a decision to make our, our um, publish our all our journals in-house. So we have flipped all our journals from, uh, uh, we have flipped our journals from, from the journals that you would be able, um, from, from subscription to full open access. And in the process, what we have managed um, is that we have seen a, a huge improvement in terms of the of the citation of those. The impact of those journals has, has, has improved quite drastically. With these few words, uh, we 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 are content that uh, the 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 route to open access is it's the route that this university should be taking. And I agree with Len and Ellen. And as a university and in library leadership, we agree that um, working together with, with the country uh, as part of Senlik, that is the only way we will be able to, to maximize uh, the cost. Because I remember when I joined this university, the then rector we had, had, had already advised that the cost of subscription was going high. And the new rector, when he started here, current rector also raised the same concern. So it is clear that we, we seriously need to work on that. With these few words, I would like to say thank you to Colleen for grazing our occasion and, and, and sharing with us the global perspective in terms of the Open Access Initiative. To Ellen, uh, it was good to see you again, Ellen and Len, from Senlik for the information discussions. I hope um, and, and, and believe that our colleagues uh, around the country, I've seen colleagues from Botswana and around the country, I think you have benefited quite a lot from the, from the engagement. And I, I look forward to, 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 to colleagues working together in, in, in achieving the initiatives of the open access. I, with these few words, I'd like to say thank you. Thank you to everyone. Thank you, Colleen. Thank you, Ellen. And Thank you to Glenn. To Prof. Coley, thank you for your guidance and, 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 and support. And to the library management, thank you, colleagues. And goodbye.